So hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you today, even though I had to pre-record this uh, presentation because of a very bad internet connection here. But I'm sure you will be uh, interested and feel free to share questions in written. Uh, you have my email at the end of the presentation. I will be happy to, to answer in the following uh, days. So I'm going to talk about a fit for purpose approach to the terminology of cannabis, hemp and cannabinoids within this um, approach, uh, fit for purpose approach to standards. Um, this presentation is mostly based on the series of scientific assessment undertaken by the World Health Organization. That's why you have my picture of me here in front of their headquarters, um, undertaken between 2015 and uh, 2020, um, you know, there is a vote in December to uh, pass the recommendation that are the result of the scientific assessment, pass this recommendation into law, into international law. So we have a bit of a challenge here and suspense until um, December, but already WHO has provided, um, has actually recognized clearly the medical use of, of cannabis and at least the use of cannabis in therapy as being uh, something to explore and research. And they have uh, also, uh, by doing that, undertaken a, a broad assessment and um, analysis of the of cannabis, the plant, its products, its derivatives, cannabinoids, um, and so on and so forth. Um, I've been following that very closely during this period, and that has allowed me to um, to prepare a um, series of papers that are currently in press that uh, I will shortly, partially present here today. So the first uh, thing I wanted to discuss with you is the purpose, the concept of purpose, which is um, at the basis of this uh, idea of fit for purpose standard that we define, as you can see here, and which is um, quite interesting when it comes to understanding what we are talking about. We see that purpose is here um, appear as elements to define hemp, for instance, hemp plant as cannabis being grown for industrial purposes is one of the numerous ways to, to, to define hemp as referring to a plant. Um, we see also that we have a problem with the terms since the term hemp can be defined in a very uh, varied number of, of ways. So that's basically what we are going to address in this presentation in two, uh, two approaches. The first approach by purpose is something that is quite common, quite normal in, in law and in policy. And it's also common in uh, drug policy, drug control law, in the laws that frame um, cannabis policies and regulations, which are um, almost all based on a single convention, a single convention on narcotic drugs. These, uh, this treaty and its complementary treaties are uh, really setting a framework for cannabis policies at the national level, which are then uh, setting on their turn a framework for the development of cannabis standards, which is where we stand. So these treaties are our three main treaties. The single convention is the most important since it's the one including cannabis as a plant, cannabis um, as products from the plant, and then the 1971 convention does include uh, THC. These conventions, as I was saying, are as many other uh, pieces of law uh, articulated on the around the concept of a purpose, purpose for the production, manufacture, export, import, distribution, trade, use, and possession of um, drugs. These are um, regulated when undertaken for medical and scientific purposes. And then the provision of the convention are um, actually providing a different framework for other purposes, which are called industrial purposes, and which are defined as non-medical and non-scientific purposes. These purposes, so it's again purposes uh, for use and possession, but also the cultivation, export, uh, manufacture, importation, and so on. 
uh, ill purpose is not medical or not scientific, it is exempt from the controls of um, the convention. Therefore, we have a, a international um, treaty framework, which uh, basically established a two-tiered regime, a legal regime um, comprehensively controlling um, the, any activity relating to cannabis when undertaken for medical or scientific purposes, and then not controlling at all anything related to cannabis when not related to uh, these same um, purposes. And this is why we have hemp existing nowadays in our uh, planet as something that can be um, developed without uh, the framework of drug control. Obviously, it depends on every country, but if countries are able to provide for a non-drug control uh, regulation of hemp, um, because there is this exemption by purpose in the convention. You can learn a bit more about that if you're interested in this paper on ResearchGate. And again, the same thing goes for CBD. CBD, when um, produced, cultivated, manufactured, or traded, or used for non-medical and non-scientific purposes is uh, not regulated by the single convention. However, when used for medical purposes or scientific research, uh, it is under control. And uh, Again, I explained this in a, yet another paper on research data that you can, you can uh, grab here, which also answers to some confusions in the assessment of the European Commission, according to which C CBD food were to be considered as narcotics. I explained that since narcotics are qualificative for medicines, medications, you can't have a narcotic food. You only have narcotic drugs. And a narcotic drug, a drug, a medicine can also be apart from being a drug in certain contexts, can also be something else. And it's the case for cannabis sativa, but it's also the case for the chili pepper plant, for instance, uh, which is used as an ingredient in pharmaceutical compounding, which is in, has its monographs in pharmacopoeias. It's also used in herbal medicine, used in cosmetics. It's used, obviously, as food, as spice, food complement somehow. Um, chili pepper is also used for by the police for pepper sprays, which are Okay, maybe we could call it recreational use for the police, right? And it's also used uh, by um, adults at home for purposes that we don't really care what they are, but they do grow it sometimes at home. And all of these different purposes have um, different lanes of regulation of policies, of laws and standards that, are, um, that concern the same plant, but that will vary depending on what is the purpose for which we are growing, trading, using this plant. And therefore, standards design with the purpose of use or uh, production in mind are not just a fancy idea. It's just a normal thing to do because it's what we are doing in other fields of, of policy and standard making. And that brings me to the second part, which concerns the terms. We can't really bring um, reach an approach by purpose if we don't have mutually understood and um, sound uh, evidence-based terminology to define what we are talking about. So to begin with, with cannabis, and again, um, being uh, sort of anchored in this international treaty framework, which, as I said, is um, absolutely critical to, to understand drug control policies at the national level, and, and as well, obviously, the framework under which standards have to not only develop, but evolve and adapt, depending on where they will be uh, implementing. So these uh, convention define, uh, provide five, sorry, four terms to define cannabis-related products, cannabis plant, which is not a drug, which is just, just a plant, and then three uh, drugs, so three medicines under control, cannabis, which are actually the buds, so flowering and fruiting tops, uh, cannabis resin, which is something separated from these tops, um, flower, flowering or fruiting tops, and then the extract and tinctures, which are not um, properly defined. So it brings us to, to this question, what is really cannabis, flowering or fruiting tops? We call it cannabis, although cannabis is also the word used to refer to the very plant. So I'm not sure it's safe to use the exact same word for the whole entire plant with roots and leaves and so on. And 
only a specific part of the plant. And some people call it flower, but I, I, I wonder why do we see a seed here in the middle of flowers? Flowers do not bear seed. It's just basic botanical um, uh, fact. Uh, fruits, however, do bear seeds. So we might be in front of fruit, but why there is there only one seed and in the middle of fruit without seed or flowers? Well, yes, indeed, it's a phenomenon well known in, in botany. Um, virgin fruits or seedless fruits uh, are actually uh, widespread in the, in the plant uh, kingdom. And they, uh, it's called parthenocarpy. The phenomenon is called parthenocarpy. So we, we are actually, when we look at cannabis buds, not in front of flowering tops, but rather fruiting tops, and in particular, parthenocarpic um, fruits, to be more precise, parthenocarpic in fructis sensis, since it's a, a, a conglomerate of, of many fruits, some of them being parthenocarpic, and sometimes some of them being regular with one seed, just as we've seen in this, in this picture. So that's a term I think important to um, uh, integrate, maybe we'll not start using parthenocarpic fruit in the daily language. I understand it's not that sexy, but when we need to get to defining accurate terms to be sure that we talk about the same thing and then to target what we want to target, we might need to uh, refer to parthenocarpic fruits, in particular um, when it comes to uh, standard making or to pharmacopoeia. Here we see the Swiss pharmacopoeia which is inspired from the, the Dutch uh, DAB uh, pharmacopoeia, which mentions cannabis flowers. The Dutch uh, monographs also mention flowers and they should mention parthenocarpic fruits. And on the other side, the Japanese and Chinese pharmacopoeias mention fruits, but they want to refer to seeds, not to the actual external layer of the fruit or to fruits without seed, which however they do here. Um, so, if we just read these pharmacopoeia monograph, we might be um, tended to think that medical cannabis um, is lawful in China and Japan because it's in the pharmacopoeia. However, it's not, it's not that easy. So terms can have some um, impact. And as we can see here, um, nowadays there are only six pharmacopoeias that include cannabis related monographs. So we still have uh, room for, for for changing that or for correcting these these terminology and avoiding more confusion with in the future more pharmacopoeia monographs that might um, that might be uh, contradictory or refer to the same thing using different botanical terms. And finally, not only do the terms vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, also between a different expert from different discipline. And finally, it also varies with time. And for instance, I saw a couple of days ago this uh, terminological change in Canada, which does have impact on, on the market and which concerns extracts, which bring me to that other question. What is this? And in what extent it is different from that? What is that? Uh, so again, I, I, I think it's just material separated from the glandular trichomes of the cannabis plant that is soluble in alcohol. Um, and this material is mostly composed of cannabinoids in a solution of aromatic compounds. This is the same thing, and it just has some kind of botanical residue in it, but it's mostly, again, the same uh, material separated from the same botanic, botanical part of the plant, which is not really parthenocarpic fruits, which are actually the trichomes, these capitate, these glandular epidermal trichomes. This is the actual botanical parts that we should focus on, not the flower or fruit or leaf or whatever, which bears the trichome, but the very trichome. Anyway, when the World Health Organization during these five years was assessing cannabis and trying to understand what's going on with all these products, what is their you know, common denominator, what is their difference, they asked five world-renowned teams of um, expert in five different uh, fields, let's say, or disciplines or groups of disciplines and um, ask them whether, um, ask them, sorry, to, to, to address uh, extract tinctures and resins of cannabis. And the result of the way they, they, they classified and the nomenclature they established for the different 
products, how they understood these products and their subcategories are, to my opinion, really interesting in terms of showing the lack of consensus in the uh, broader scientific community on defining the products that we are talking about. Uh, however, as I was saying, it all comes to um, simple um, uh, extract. We see here uh, again the chili pepper, which has uh, its own monographs in the European Pharmacopeia, and our extracts, hashish concentrates, BHO, rosin, etc. They are all oleoresins, to my opinion, oleoresins being um, this um, solution of active compounds, in this case cannabinoids, in a, uh, aromatic compounds uh, of uh, different kinds. I believe it might be an interesting way to define uh, this material, which has a main point in common, that is it's the extract from the uh, trichomes of the plant, sometimes with the external layer of the tri trichomes head, sometimes without, but it's always the same, uh, mostly the same material. And then we could, within cannabis oleoresins, subdivide and differentiate on the basis of evidence uh, between these products by referring to their methods of obtention, their, the way they are obtained, their methods of either concentration, extraction, separation, um, purification, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which are what we really actually might want to know about a product more than knowing its sort of brand name, that is the oil, it's a concentrate, it's a dry sift, it's a FICO or whatever. We might be more interested to know how has it been exactly obtained with solvents or not, what kind of solvents with temperature, et cetera, et cetera. The International Drug Control Convention tried to provide some uh, assistance on that, but unfortunately failed. This is what uh, is explained in the 61 convention. And when we put it, we try to make it simple. It gives this, so this is how international law sees the processes of, of extraction, modification, transformation, manufacture, et cetera, between uh, of cannabis uh, from the original material to a final uh, cannabis product that can be consumed. Um, if any of you understand anything in that, I please write me an email because I've been trying to understand that for a couple of years and I never got any clue of what am I supposed to, to get with that. So the drug control convention don't really provide any, any kind of help on, on the processes of obtention of cannabis uh, oleoresins, but uh, there is an interesting uh, thing that I want to mention, the INCB, and International Narcotic Control, control Board, one of the international institutions uh, overseeing the drug control, uh, they have assigned the CAS registry number for a THC to cannabis resin, extract and tincture, and refined resin. So they have gathered all of that, grouped it with the CAS registry number of THC, while we know that THC itself is under control in another convention, the 71 convention. So it's already complex, but the way it is being interpreted and put into practice by international institution is sometimes even more complex. And that brings us to, to THC and to the terminology of cannabinoids. Again, a short uh, insight, maybe that's something I'm uh, always talking about, but I want to, 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 to say it again. INNs, international non-proprietary names, are something that we use extremely uh, often. It's really a, a well-admitted standard and we almost never, I mean, uh, no, nobody refers to aspirin with its uh, name of its scientific formula. Um, we only do it for minus trans delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, tetra which is not really easy to pronounce. There is an international non-proprietary name for THC, for minus trans delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is dronabinol. And we unfortunately do not use it, even though it's um, somehow useful, more simple and quite clear, since THC also includes, as you might know, um, a number of variants, subvariants, isomer, stereoisomers, and in the end, the one that people consumed in cannabis that is present in, I mean, that is derived from natural cannabis plants and which is mimicked in laboratory to obtain marinol, 
uh, it's the same molecule, it's dronabinol, and it's one particular stereoisomer of one particular isomer of THCs. So instead of going into this complex stuff, we could just know we are talking about these molecules that get people high or that get them um, certain medical effects, and which is called dronabinol. Why don't we do it? We don't do it because there is a popular belief that dronabinol is only referring to um, minus trans delta 9 THC obtained in vitro, obtained outside of, obtained, sorry, in a laboratory, which is not the case. The molecule is the same whether obtained in a laboratory or from the plant. It's the same molecule, but there is a misunderstanding which has somehow hampered the, the ability of using dronabinol as a generally accepted term. And that's, to my opinion, a, a pity. In addition to that, THC is subject to an extremely complex set of controls with um, the different delta 9, delta 8, delta 6 be being controlled in different schedules in the 71 convention, and THC being controlled in two conventions. So the INCB, again, this international body provides some guidance which says, if you have THC, if it's obtained from cannabis sativa, then it is controlled under the 1961 convention. And if it's obtained from, and I quote, synthetic origin, then it's controlled under the uh, 1971 convention. So that's extreme, extremely complex. And that's why one of the outcome of the, the WHO assessment has been to recommend placing all of these different isomers and stereoisomers in the same schedule of the same convention. Uh, with the possibility for preparation that contain THC to be placed in a lower schedule, which is a schedule for access for medical uses. Again, that's just a parenthesis, but when we get back to, to this, this guidance of the INCB saying let's separate cannabis sativa obtained from plants and that obtained from a synthetic origin. Now that we have techniques allowing a genetical modification of of the biosynthetic pathways of living organism to produce THC, to produce phytocannabinoids found in cannabis sativa, but also to produce what they call unnatural analogs, what I call neocannabinoids, um, substances that don't exist in nature, for instance, um, Nabilon. Now that we have this kind of, of product, if I obtain a THC from genetically engineered yeasts or even genetically modified um, hops plant that would biosynthesize um, THC, where would that fall under control? Would that fall under control of the 61 convention? No, because it's not from cannabis sativa. Would that fall under control of the 71 convention? No, because it's not uh, obtained uh, by synthesis as understood as being obtained in vitro. So. Here we see that terms and have uh, an actual impact on international policy. And I think that it all goes back to the misunderstanding of the word synthesis. Synthesis is not a synonym of this particular process of obtaining molecules in a laboratory. This is just one particular kind of synthesis, but the biosynthesis, the synthesis made by living organisms, including plants, including humans, is also synthesis, is also a form of synthesis. Synthesis is simply the obtention of chemical compounds from more simple compounds. It can be made by a body, a plant, uh, can be made by um, a, you know, a chemist in a laboratory. It is all synthesis. So confusion with the, with the understanding of synthesis is to my opinion a big problem and it's added to the confusion with cannabinoids. I mean, just look at that. Okay, this is Wikipedia. It's not necessarily the, the best reference, but I think it's interesting to show the extent to which cannabinoids are numerous, varied, and already somehow at least have enough information to have their own Wikipedia page for, for most of them. I believe it's, uh, and if you look at this table, you see that phytocannabinoids are just present in the first row at the top However, I am a bit confused when I see synthetic cannabinoids below. So I have a problem when I see synthetic cannabinoids below. Uh, there are a number of rows for synthetic cannabinoids. However, I'm used to hear people refer to marinol as synthetic THC, synthetic cannabinoids. So why, why is it 
placed under phytocannabinoids and not under synthetic THC. There are also confusion with what is what are cannabinoids and what are what is synthesis and what are synthetic cannabinoids. I don't even mention you the, the, the confusion that we have. Again, this is a, just a piece uh, taken from the D8270-20 uh, standards on terminology, uh, which is uh, just no comment. Mm, so this, to my opinion, deserves um, some reflection uh, since we have new forms of obtaining cannabinoids, new cannabinoids, and uh, new forms of obtaining old cannabinoids, right? I believe we have to make um, a distinction which is not necessarily based on the very chemical molecular structure of compounds, which is the way um, cannabinoids are usually classified, but rather on, on the bioethical approach, which would be uh, twofold. So what I propose is to, you will see here horizontally, um, a criteria which is um, mutually exclusive. Is the cannabinoid compound existing in the natural environment or is it not? For instance, THC, CBD, they exist naturally. They existed before human being was on the planet to craft them. However, Nabilon did not exist on the planet. It has been fully crafted by um, human beings, which is okay, but it just needs to be sort of acknowledged and separated from uh, the other cannabinoids. When we refer to THC to marinol, for instance, synthetic THC, as it's called, it would be here in the in the in the first row of cannabinoid compounds that occur in nature. Even though it's obtained in a laboratory, it is occurring in nature. So we might know different uh, set of information about that compound, for instance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this first distinction between compounds occurring in nature and compounds new, invented, novel, uh, designer drugs in a way, I think it's important. And I propose the terms paleocannabinoids to refer to the compounds that uh, are naturally occurring in the environment because it's a Greek terminology, it's a Greek lemma. It's, this is inspired from the tradition of, of neologists in natural sciences, which is mostly based on, on, on Greek uh, prefixes and suffixes. So, Paleo versus neo means basically ancient versus new. So paleocannabinoids are those that that preceded the arrival of, of Homo sapiens with its laboratories and its desire to craft new compounds. And neocannabinoids are these new crafted compounds. And then on the vertical um, axis, I propose to make uh, to clarify what is synthesis, what are synthesis. There are mainly two big families of synthesis, the one done by a natural organism, which is biosynthesis, and then the one done by humans in a laboratory or in what we call in vitro or at least ex vivo settings, which mean um, the obtention of compounds from more simple compounds outside of the natural um, way of synthesizing this compound in nature, right? Ex vivo means outside of the living, outside of the manner it is being undertaken in um, life um, without external um, input. So these two main uh, types of synthesis, I believe need nowadays to be uh, subdivided, in particular biosynthesis. Biosynthesis, when I see, I receive a lot of cannabis newsletter and these kind of things. And I, I've seen recently, and I've, I see it a lot, uh, biosynthetic cannabinoids on the rise, uh, yeah, biosynthetic cannabinoid, uh, which is supposed to refer to these particular compounds obtained from genetically engineered yeasts. So this is a column in the middle here. And I believe this is not, this is biosynthesis actually, but calling these cannabinoids obtained from genetically engineered uh, living organism, calling them uh, biosynthetic, I think is partially misleading. They are biosynthetic, but they are obtained from biosynthetic pathway which do not exist in a natural environment. And that's, uh, I think, uh, quite important to, to underline. That's why again, 
um, uh, not only because I mean, it's important to underline also because as you can see here, the natural unmodified biosynthesis, synthesis in vivo, only uh, uh, you can only obtain with this kind of synthesis, the compounds that are naturally occurring, occurring in nature. However, with genetically modified uh, organisms, we can obtain designer cannabinoids, neocannabinoids, unnatural analogs of cannabinoids uh, from living organisms. And that's absolutely uh, critical to, to underline the differences is major. So I also suggest uh, terms, again, based on the same uh, terminological tradition, uh, in particular terms to distinguish between the two kinds of biosynthesis that we have nowadays. Um, true biosynthesis, eubia biosynthesis is again a, a Greek prefix that means true, real, unmodified. So U biosynthesis would be the synthesis in vivo in living organisms that have not been uh, altered by uh, targeted human intervention on their biosynthetic pathways. Meanwhile, this biosynthesis, uh, again, in Greek, you and this are the two prefixes that oppose one another. This biosynthesis will be the uh, untrue, unnatural uh, biosynthesis, or partially unnatural, since it is a natural phenomenon, but which has been targetedly altered by uh, human um, genetic um, modifications. I think the uh, these two words are really um, critical to in the years to come to make sure that we know what we are talking about again, even maybe not necessarily the terms per se, but the categorification that is proposed. And finally, the word poesynthesis is more as a manner to avoid confusion with the word synthesis being used to refer to that particular kind of ex vivo and in vitro synthesis. Um, Poesynthesis is mimicked again from Greek uh, prefixes and is, you can compare it to poetry. Poetry has the same prefix. Poetry is the art of, of crafting sentences, beautiful sentences with more simple words or more simple pieces of sentences. Well, poesynthesis would be an equivalent uh, vision, the art uh, for humans to crafting substances, uh, compounds using more simple compounds. I think with this two-tiered approach, uh, we can uh, reasonably adopt a bioethical nomenclature of, of cannabinoids that will be much more useful in policy making and in standard making than the, um, the nomenclatures arranged uh, on the basis of chemical formula, chemical structures of compound, which are extremely useful in research, but not necessarily in the fields that concern us today. So this is it. I will leave it here today. Thank you very much for your, atta your attention, for staying uh, until the end. I wanted also obviously to thank Fundacion Cana from Spain and Hempoint from the Czech Republic for having supporting uh, my work along these years. It's been a long uh, period of research, intensive efforts, huge amount of documentation considered and uh, their help has been critical. I also wanted to say that nowadays I still um, need support for my research. And since I am an independent researcher, I also need your support. Uh, you can easily uh, take part in, in my efforts by becoming a patron on this link. Um, as I told you earlier, we are still in the process of defending the scientific based outcome of the WHO um, with the perspective of a vote this December at the United Nations that will be a historical milestone in international cannabis policy that will have impact in the coming months and years, uh, whatever the outcome is. So in order to continue uh, exercising expertise and bringing knowledge to this uh, critical um, institution that has we've seen frame, eventually frame our work through international law, um, support is needed. And if you become a patron, obviously, I, I might uh, mention that I provide exclusive content, early access, I can answer a specific question, and you probably be happy to, to learn a lot of things by, by joining. So thank you again for your attention, and have a great uh, day, have a great workshop. Bye-bye.